If you don't know me, my name's Steve. I'm the vicar here at St. John's, St. Peter's and St. Richard's. It's just great to be with you. Welcome to Church Hat, wherever you might be, whether you're here uh, in person or online. But um, we're going on, as the video would have played without me being here, with my dulcet tones, on a journey through the Gospel of Mark. And we've been really saying as a couple and as a church, uh, in our hearts, in our homes, in our church, in our region, this is like no time like before, and I know all churches say this, but to diligently seek Jesus. To diligently seek, to diligently hold, get him to allow us to hold our heads in his hands. I've spoken about that image of being a policeman and being led through, leading a child through a difficult scene. And you hold that child's head and say, look at me, look at me. Don't to the left, don't look to the right, but look at me. And I think that God's what God said to us in the last year is constantly, don't look to the left, don't get distracted, just look at me. And so, if you want to get a word from God, people quite often come up to me or come up to different people and say, can you pray, I want a word from God. Well, to get to a word from God is to be in the word of God. So read the word of God. If you want to be, uh, quite often we read the Bible, but actually the Bible should read us. We write it, read it for knowledge, but actually we read it to be transformed. There's a slide that we shared on Vision Sunday, just going to come up, if that's okay. The one, that's great. So we start... We're going to move it around slowly. We start with worship, which we've done this morning. We're going to Bible study. We actually look at the Bible, read the Bible, examining it together. We're going to offer spaces to do that, which we have. And at 7.25, uh, roughly, people start queuing outside Crope Coffee House in the morning. And I know people are hungry for the Word of God. And uh, we'll meet in there and we're going through John's Gospel. We've got 7.30 on a Thursday at St. Richard's where we're going through the creed. So we're looking at what we believe. So out of a Bible study, we're going to see what we believe. And then we, start, we examine that together. We read the Word of God, let it read us. And then we look at, so into it a little bit deeper. And then we meditate. Meditate means to chew over. It means linger in it. It doesn't mean it's a 15-minute devotion in the morning. This is like an hour long. What we're trying to do as a couple, do it three times a week, an hour and a bit long, and meditate. And what I'm suggesting is to do it, maybe just that Bible studies, and see what happens. So it's to meditate, and then you come to prayer. When you pray without reading the Word of God and meditating on it, your prayers are very different. When you just do the Bible study without meditating, it's very different. When you've Bible studied and meditated and asked to seek and partner with the Holy Spirit in your Bible study, your prayers are different. They are. I know because some of mine are very like, God, can you help save me, get me out of here? If, if, if you do this, I might do this. When I've meditated on the Word of God, knowing the grace and the truth that is in it, I come out with prayers that are his prayers, not mine. And then we act, and then we go around the circle all again. So that's where we're in. Uh, apart from this service lunch, after the six o'clock, quite often, I'm going to do a Q&A. So if you want to stay and go deeper, and it might be only one or two of us, but just a Q&A about the preach. We often do the preaches, and we all scuttle off home, don't we? And we go, what on earth was Steve talking about? I'm saying that. But maybe if we're Q&A, you can ask any question at all. There's no question that's off piece about the preach I've done. And so that may be somewhere we go deeper. You see, we do live in a world, as I said when I preached on Vision Sunday on Psalm 42. That's why I love that gratitude, by the way, that gratitude song that James sang just before the giving place. Because that is Psalm 42. Our brokenness, and then he comes to that bit when he goes, pour out my, he starts preaching to his soul. Because I started thinking, well, you can't just grab yourself by the bootstraps. But he's done a lot of meditating in that moment in Psalm 42. So that's why I like that song particularly, because he starts telling himself, come on, my soul. And so, what was I talking about? Oh, yeah, the world. Got carried away with the, the song. Uh, the world is full of disruption in community. Where's a society in the West? We've never been more lost and alone. We've never... No, we've never been so without belonging. We can belong on the internet, we can belong on chats on uh, Facebook, but we don't really belong because actually they turn quite quickly into toxicity and them and us. So there's a disruption in society that occurs throughout all of us. 
then there's really distressing life events that hit us again and again. And suddenly, as Christians, we have somewhere to turn. And also, there's depression or anxiety, fear, loneliness. There's epidemic levels. And the thing is, once and only, it's always Jesus is the answer. Again and again. Warren, I love you have, having you here. It's great. Praise the, Lord. Praise the Lord. But we all have our idols. We all have our emotions. We all have our stuff that we bring in realness and openness to Jesus. In our broken weakness, he heals and restores us. And we can get distracted and we can drift. I can be distracted about a half hour after I've done my Bible study, if I'm behind a wheel of a car. I can drift in my thought process really easily when I get into the evening, when I'm tired, and I think I want to zone out on Netflix. We can drift and be distracted, but this is a time to diligently seek. And we're entering into, you know, when we were saying about diligently seeking Jesus, what should we do? Well, the best place to start is the Gospels, the stories of Jesus' life. Because that's all about Jesus. Let's not go into another letter or Old Testament book like before. Let's look at a gospel together. And that's what we're going to do. And I love the gospel of Mark. Mainly because it's short. No, I'm joking. It's part of that. But it's Mark, Luke, uh, Matthew and John. But Mark is immediate. It's sudden. It's got a pace. It's not poetic. If it's a newspaper, it's not the Times or the Guardian. It's more like a tabloid. It's something you can quickly read into. It's metros you grab. But it's straight to the point. It feels like to me that Mark's really excited to tell us something. But he just wants to get to it. He's talking to a Roman audience, so maybe the birth of Jesus wasn't that important to them. But actually he's getting straight to the point. He's clear and he's direct, but he has massive depth in every word that he carries. In the police... This is for Robin Webb who said, you haven't done enough police stories recently. In the police, there was a phrase, you got trained on how to use the radio. And so when you're on the radio, when you're, everyone else wants to speak at a different point, you're taught that you need to be ABS. You need to have accuracy, brevity and speed. If you don't and start talking on the radio too long, everyone starts yawning and snoring. Literally, as you can hear it in the old radios, you could talk over and someone's talking for too long a time, everyone will start snoring. And so I think Mark's got accuracy, brevity, speed because he's got a message to tell and he wants you to get it. And so let's start with the word of God. The Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, verse 1. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in the prophet Isaiah. See, I'm sending my messengers ahead of you who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The beginning. The beginning. We could do a whole sermon just on the beginning. It takes us back to Genesis in the beginning. It's echoed in John's gospel. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. In the beginning. The beginning. That says to me that we've got a chance of a new beginning every day. Well, when we mess up, when we royally get it wrong, there's a time to start again. And the grace of Jesus Christ is we get to start again and again and again. Maybe May... The first Sunday of May is a new start with reading the Bible, of starting your lives again. This is where you rip up the past, wipe the board clean, put a line in the sand. This is where that vacuum of desire, that holy discontent, that poor in spirit, you come. Not in our strength, not in our power, but in our weakness. It's the beginning. What it says to me is, I've had a beginning and I'm in that story but he hasn't finished yet. It's not the beginning and the end. It's, I started my journey, I've messed up, I'm coming back. I started my journey, I've messed up and I've come back. Or maybe for you today, it's like, I've not even started my journey. This is my beginning. But those words, just those two words say, 
There's a fresh start. There's hope in our mess. In our disruption of community, where we don't feel we belong, where we feel on the outside, there's a beginning to get some things we've got wrong right with Jesus. In your 20s, in your 30s, in your 40s, and now I know in my 50s, I need the beginning to be keep on the beginning. In my 20s, I thought I'd nailed it. I thought I was such an expert. In my 30s, I realised I wasn't. In my 40s, I was repairing what I did in the 30s. And in the 50s, I'm thinking, well, maybe I'm just about, in the words of Karen Carpenter, it's only just begun. So it's just to give you hope that everyone's in the same boat. No one's got it. No one's perfect. We're all, in the words of high school musical one, in this together. Did you know, scientifically, that 1% of our cells regenerate every day? So you are beginning every day. And so today, you might be 1% regenerating some aspect of your life. So we are always writing a story in our lives. It's never written. It's never definite. It's not the end. It is the beginning. 1% of you is different by the end of this day than it was the beginning. Scientifically, I think that's spiritually as well. So let's have hope as we open this up. And the good thing is you don't do it on your own. God has sent the Holy Spirit, the power of the person, the presence of the Holy Spirit, to guide you and be with you. Open up that scripture. And that beginning is a story you write in collaboration, not on your own. First word, that's two words done. We're here for a long time. Oh, the good news. The gospel, euangelion. We've heard it many times. The Greek, good news. It's not another word in front of it. It doesn't say the social gospel. It doesn't say the therapeutic gospel. It doesn't say the prosperity gospel. It says the gospel of Jesus Christ. There is no other. If you put a word in front of it, you've made it not the gospel. The social gospel is the only way that you can serve Jesus is doing good works and serving the poor. That's not true. You've got to be studying and doing other stuff and looking after yourself as well. Sometimes you get burnt out just on the social gospel. The therapeutics gospel is great and where we often need to start is I'm loved by God, I'm loved by God, I love my God. But God doesn't leave you that way. He wants you to be loved in order to do his mission. The prosperity gospel is once I come to Jesus Christ, everything else is going to be brilliant and there'll be blessings and power. There will be blessings and power, but because you, there won't be blessings and power, how you feel it will be. I know as, since I've become a Christian, life hasn't been easy. But my goodness, with Jesus Christ, I couldn't have got through it. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. The beginning of the good news of, or some translations say about, Jesus the Messiah or Christ. About. That tells me to keep my eyes fixed on the next words, which is Jesus. It's about him. Our lives start with him. Uh, I've got the middle with him and have the end with him. There is nothing that is worth living without him. The world is lost without him. I only started living at 36 when I came to Christ in my brokenness, following an attempt or a thought of an attempt on my life when I was so broken and suddenly came in and I started living. That's the joy of the gospel. We need him. Jesus, the one who saves. That doesn't mean he's playing number one on Monday in goal for Crawley. It's the one who saves literally our lives. It's it's what his name means, Jesus, the one who saves. You can't do salvation without him. And so he has an exclusive claim on salvation. We're not part of one big, uh, God isn't one big elephant as you might have heard that in the dark you grab hold of his leg and that's the pillar and that's the pillar of faith and that's a different faith. Jesus is quite clear. He's either a madman to claim to be who he is or he is who he is and he's the only way to the Father. So it's Jesus, Messiah, Christ, anointed, the one that Old Testament is telling us all about, the king, the priest, the prophet, the suffering servant, the Christ, the Messiah, the person that the Jewish people were waiting to see. We've been preaching about it for weeks in Advent, haven't we? That actually they, they were expecting a king that was going to get rid of the Roman Empire. What they got was a king and a suffering servant that would die for us. And so the Messiah is to say the anointed Christ over our lives is 
we have a king, a priest and a prophet. And finally, just on this first bit, the son of God. It doesn't say like I am, I'm a child of God, I'm a son of God. Liz is a daughter of God. It says the son of God. This means he was literally the son of God. So he's fully human in Jesus, fully divine as the son of God. Not 50-50, split down the middle. Today he was 75% fully divine because that's what he needed to be. 25% human. No, he was completely 100% human and 100% divine. And the trouble is we like things to be black and white, don't we? We don't like grey areas. We want is a yes and a no. But the problem with the gospel is mysterious. He's both fully human, fully divine. And it's wonderful. They're just the first few words of Mark's gospel. So you see, you're straight into it straight away. But you see the depth in each of those. If you just went away today and meditated on that, my goodness, you'd have a rich week. Just listing, maybe just the beginning. Where's your story? Write your story out. The good news of Jesus. Look into it. Look into it and depth into it. We're going to do a little bit of that today. This is a sermon of two parts. I'm never, ever going to finish what I want to say today. It is just the beginning. Like what I did there, Pete. Anyway, good. And then Jesus. Just look at this man gaze on him I used to think he was fluffy and weak when I didn't have any faith and thought oh yeah Jesus but as I got to know him I saw a powerful strong humble and meek calm mild everything you'd want in a person all capsulated in him the most emotionally intelligent man that's ever lived he knew exactly how to speak to the different people in the bible exactly the way they would hear it he doesn't heal people the same way doesn't he? it's not a formula What he does is read their hearts and speak to them. What he did to me when I was 36 was read my heart and spoke to me. That's what he does individually to you right now. That is the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news. Both peace and risk, grace and truth, joy and tears, the now but not yet, the both and, the alpha and omega, the word made flesh, the Lord law made real, the abstract becoming concrete, the up there, down here the big made small it's not an idea it's a man it's a relationship it's an intimate relationship with him he wants to get to know them he wants to get to know us and he wants to get to know me it starts in my own heart we've spoken many times the last few weeks that unless my heart's right then my home won't be right And I was called to bring Jesus into my home. And when I get into my home, right, I might be able to bring Jesus to the church I lead. And when I get the home, the heart, got it in the wrong order, the church, maybe we'll bring it to the region. So it begins with me and it begins with you, with the good news of Jesus Christ. You see, the good news of Jesus Christ, if it's not good news for all, it's not good news for anyone. Because if it's not good news for all, so it's not, you know, some people accept it, some people don't. But if it's not good news for all of us, then there's got to be some bad news. But it starts with good news. And it's open to all. There's some bad news if you don't follow the way of Jesus. But it's open to all at the beginning. We've got a choice to make. To surrender, to accept and obey. But what we're going to do as we go into the gospel, the beginning of the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God, we're going to look a little bit about the hermeneutics, which is a long word that preachers like to say, which means we're going to look into the background of the passage. What was Mark trying to say? Because when we look into the background of the passage, it sometimes speaks into our hearts today. It's the context what changes our world. You think, I think when we look at the context, we realise that sometimes church can domesticate us in our faith. Mark Batson tells a great story, and I haven't got time for it today, how he visited a zoo. And he saw a zoo, and he saw the animals, and he saw the animals that are so free in the wild, that behind bars change. 
And sometimes when we become Christians, we have that risk-taking life. And sometimes we've taken discipleship as taming people rather than let them fly. It's a challenge for me as a church leader. And so I wonder where he wants us to fly. What he hasn't done is remove the risk of being a disciple of Jesus. It's really important to be accountable, to steward what he's given us, to make home, our church, a safe place, especially with what's building up in the culture around us. But he's sending us out into the world. We think discipling might be that we are just domesticating people into a safe place with nice friends in a nice place. Actually, the Gospels that we're going to read and open up will challenge us to be out and sent out. The will of God isn't an insurance plan. The will of God is a dangerous plan if we follow him with all our hearts. I've realized that over time that actually quite often I crave comfort and to get away when actually Jesus is calling me for my comfort to step out. He will send us trials and tests, but he sends us help and all we need. What he's not doing is asking us to withdraw and hide, but be open and real. You see, we want Jesus without his betrayal by Judas or being mocked by the Pharisees or being suffering at the hands of others. We say we want to be like Jesus, but that's what being like Jesus is like. The context of the first century was, I can't sugarcoat it, was tough and bloody. The disciples, I could list how they came to their end. But I'm going, really? Is that what I'm signing up for? I think it's a different world, don't get me wrong. But if we read the, you know, the, the stories of the 12 and Matthias included, only John the Beloved saw it to old age after he'd escaped death and was exiled to an island in Pathos where we get the book of Revelation. We are being called to be transformed in our trials. The seed of the church was these early martyrs. C.S. Lewis, in his book, uh, Lion, Witch and the Wardrobe, have the character, the beaver. It's a, like a metaphor for uh, faith. The beaver is asked by the children about Aslan, who is the Christ-like figure. And the beaver says, safe, safe, safe. Following Aslan isn't safe, but it's good. But it's good. That's the gospel, the good news. These disciples stepped out and they lived a life. But they had eternity they were looking at. To give you some background before we unpack it properly next week. There's two dates that would have marked Mark's gospel. The first one is July the 19th, AD 64. It's when Rome burnt. The whole Rome, this huge, huge empire, burnt to the ground. There's lots of background stories whether Nero did it himself, his emperor Nero. But that was something that actually Rome burnt. The center of power was burnt to the ground. Second date, they'd have written it, with a focus on was in August AD 70. Jerusalem was the temple, the place of worship of God was torn down by the Romans. You see, he's writing, Mark, to two sets of people. One that had seen their spiritual home ripped down and one that had seen their power base burnt to the ground. You see, at the time that this is writing, there is a lot of bad news and fake news. Where do we live today? In a world with a lot of fake news and bad news. And what do we need? Good news. Good news of Jesus Christ. And so, in our anxiety, in our fear, in this news, we're called to be people of good news. Governments, power, politicians will come and go. The kingdom of God, Jesus Christ the Son of God will stand. And so we might be fearful in today's world. 
And I don't blame us when we look at the headlines, when we look at what's happening politically, economically, socially and spiritually. But we shouldn't be, because the victory is won. His life, his death, his resurrection, his ascension is good news then and it's good news now. It's where we can take risks yet be calm, have peace yet be excited, be adventurous yet have rest. The gospel of Jesus Christ and being a Christian is nothing Everyone says, is it a life of boring? Christians are boring. If you live the Gospels, it is an adventure. It is a risk. It is life to the full. The Gospel holds all things in tension. The now but not yet, the human and divine. One of the people that has really influenced me spiritually is the sermons of Tim Keller. And he's recently died. Me and Liz had the pleasure to go to a church conference in New York in January. We went to his Redeemer Church. And, you know, and it felt, oh my goodness, this is where uh, Tim Keller preached for many years. I'm reading his biography right now. And it's telling uh, how he was formed. And he's a man of God, a man of his word. But he would describe this as a definition of the gospel. Brilliant. We are more sinful and flawed in ourselves than we ever dared believe. Yet at the very same time, more loved and accepted in Jesus Christ than we ever dared hoped. We are more sinful and flawed in ourselves than we ever dared believe. Yet at the same time, more loved and accepted in Jesus Christ than we ever dared hope. That basically tells me, oh my goodness, I need Jesus. And that tells me that, oh my goodness, Jesus has accepted me. Both at the same time. If you stay in one, you feel condemned and shamed. If you stay in the other, then you're just accepted and you'll stay where you are. And that's not the whole gospel. One thing. So you say grace and truth. This is the grace and truth of Jesus. J.J. Packer, who wrote Knowing God, said this. That the gospel is five elements. It's God. It's humanity. It's our sin. The third part is Jesus Christ, the take on his blessing. The fourth is our repentance. And the fifth is a new community. Yeah, I think the writer of Mark tells us the story of redemption. See, his name was John Mark. He was a disciple of Paul, who was one of the first apostles who was sent out to plant churches. And the thing is, the book of Acts tells me, tells us that he messed it up. He got it wrong. He was sent home with bad behaviour. Paul said, get him away. I don't want him here. Get rid of him. Oh, my word. I don't know if I would have picked myself up from that. But he went back and he was discipled by Peter. And most commentators would agree that the gospel of Mark is Peter's recollection of his walk with Jesus it's a working class man's account it's a fisherman's account the account of a man that was denied denied Jesus three times and brought back in and so I reckon and I don't know it's not written down but John Mark Mark came back to Jerusalem and was absolutely filled with shame and didn't know which way to turn and all his friends were going I thought you were that great missionary I thought we were going to go and change the world. He said, oh yeah, I messed up. And Peter went, all right. I remember my gospel for my life. When I messed up, Jesus came to me. Do you know what? I think I'm given an opportunity to be the gospel for someone else. And so he saw the messed up life. He didn't reject him. He brought him in. And he discipled him. To the point that we see Paul and uh, John Mark reunited in the book of Acts. And Paul's gone, what has happened to you? That's not in scripture, but that's, the, that's my interpretation of scripture. And that is the writer of the words we get today. The gospel of Mark, a complete failure. Someone who's messed up, who's given another chance. That's all our stories. People that fail, that messed up, and who's given another chance. I wonder who you're being called to be risky with. There's someone that you walk alongside that you need to reach out to give the good news. Maybe you need to reach out this morning and walk alongside 
to get the good news from someone else who can share it. That's meditating on the word of God. Maybe this week is that week to see a brother and sister in Christ and say, do you want to do a Bible study? We're just going to do those words. And we're going to do it together and spend some time together and pray it through. That's going to be way more, way more beneficial to both of you than watching a Netflix series or distracting yourself with something else of the world. This is where the rubber hits the road. Because when you do that, you invite the Holy Spirit in. Maybe in encounter this uh, Tuesday, we'll just spend time praying and worshipping and singing in these words. These words make a difference. I was going to do a little bit about John the Baptist, but I'm not. I'm just going to sit there with this for a bit. We'll do that next week. I think the gospel can be summed up by lots of different ways. I was looking at different definitions from different uh, theologians. There's hundreds. <laughs> but they all come to this one sort of common theme that we need to know how much we need Jesus through our brokenness. And he loves us in that brokenness. I spoke to the staff team this week about the first people that called out to the name of the Lord. We have Genesis, the story, don't we, of the fall of our brokenness. Adam and Eve, God is asking the question still today, where are you and who said that to you? So where are you? Because we want to escape God. Who told you that to? Who are you putting your trust to? The world, the flesh or the devil? And they mess up and they have Cain and Abel and there's the first murder and the plan seems to have gone wrong. And then Adam lays with his wife and there's a new baby. But the namings of those words of Abel means insignificant and vapour. Seth, the next in the line, means placed and positioned. And then there's Enosh. Enosh, you don't hear a lot about. It's just one mention. Little walk on part. His name means frail and weak. So the first people that ever called on the name of the Lord. Maybe the first prayer. You could argue what prayer was like. But the first covenantal prayer on calling on the name of the Lord was done by people that were insignificant, weak and broken, yet placed. Because they knew they needed Jesus. Mark is writing a book telling us we need Jesus. Shall we stand?